The way we consume and share news today, it is largely rooted in social media outlets, a reason why it's crucial to look at what's being discussed online. From the hottest issues to trends for our daily social media minute, we're joined by Yerka in the studio. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Happy Thursday. Yes, to you too. <laughs> Some weeks are really, really slow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? You power through. All right, let's jump into our first buzzword of the day. Now, from what I little I understand, when it comes to imitation K food, but mm. when it comes to any recipe, um, any food products, yeah, it becomes really difficult to, I think, prove copyright uh, when there are these copycat mm-hmm. products uh, over long. Which the there are shows. lots of, and and it happens in different parts of the world. But what if it unabashedly copies the logo, <laughs> the and design, the design, the recipe, the everything? Yeah. All right. So what seems to be the big problem here? Um. So we're talking about uh, imitated Korean food products made in China. Okay. Actually, and okay. Uh, you know this is nothing new. Things mm. have. Things like this have surfaced over and over again in the past, but uh, we're we're talking about more sophisticated, um, sophisticated imitation. Yes, you know, a more uh, realistic bl- looking replica, blatantly imitating uh, K food, mm. uh, down to the taste. Actually, not just the packaging anymore. And uh, a South Korean politician is urging uh, the government to. Uh, come up with measures to prevent Chinese food companies mm. from releasing these imitated versions of K foods. Mm. Um, you know, they're they're now putting Korean language on their products as well. So, I mean, this won't fool Korean consumers, obviously, mm. because we can read Korean. But uh, for <laughs> foreigners, you know, they they just look at the package and they're like, oh, there's that chicken that that breathes fire out of its mouth. Is that what the icon looks? Okay, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Character. Okay, exactly. Uh, and then they're probably going to buy it. They're very, there's a very good chance mm. that, uh, you know, the consumer uh, <laughs> with an unknowing eye right. will be confused. Without questioning whether or not it's the legitimate. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So a lawmaker from the People Power Party and a member of the National Assembly's Agriculture, Forestry, Livestock, Food, Marine and Fisheries Committee mm. emphasized in a recent press release that mm. Chinese companies are blatantly imitating K-food products and uh, call for the government to formulate countermeasures. Eric, as you've said, there have been other cases where Chinese companies imitated mm-hmm. brands, product names of Korean companies in the past, the packaging, like you said. Right. This isn't the first time that something like this has happened mm-hmm. and surfaced on the news. Right. However, in recent days, uh, the instances where Chinese companies use the Korean language to confuse consumers have been <sighs> on the rise. A prime example is a Chinese Chinese brand selling products under the brand name Sanai. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, this company operates as a Chinese distributor of major uh, Korean food company. Uh, they engage in the sale and distribution of these counterfeit fake Korean foods, both online and offline, by replicating product designs. As you've said, what is concerning is mm-hmm. that they're actually using, again, Korean script That's on right. the packaging, which yeah. won't fool, again, Korean consumers who can read Korean, mm. understand Korean, but not foreigners. Yeah, so imitate products can be mistaken for Korean products. Uh, you know, product names like Puldak mm. uh, you know, Hayan Cholongtang, mm. and uh, Matsugum are ah. all written in Hangul. And those are pretty recognizable. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Now, in the case of these like fire noodles, those super, super spicy <laughs> ramen <laughs> noodles, uh, which are very popular yeah. uh, on this on social media mm. and YouTube. It's like a challenge. Yeah, even the, the image of the chicken character spitting fire uh, is just, it's exactly the same. I took a look at it this morning. Mm. It's exactly the same, Mm-mm-mm. I have to say, yeah. Mm-mm-mm. Anyways, uh, back in December of 2021, uh, Korean food companies led by the Korea Food Industry Association, they formed a joint uh, consultative body, mm-hmm. which aimed at uh, basically eradicating 
counterfeit K food products. And okay. this collective, they filed a lawsuit against uh. nine products in a Chinese court. They highlighted infringements on items like, you know, the the Puldukster fried noodles, okay. the Tashida sugar and mm. salt, as well as Taesang foods, rice, anchovy products, seaweed, and uh, noodles from mm. the brand Otugi. So in the past, companies have individually sought administrative crackdowns on yes. counterfeit products. Individually is the key point. Right. Yeah. So one company mm-hmm. filing a lawsuit, another company uh, separately filing That's a lawsuit. Right. Uh, is this the first joint litigation on trademark infringement, particularly in China? Yes, it's the first joint litigation okay. on trademark infringement in China. Um, the lawsuit uh, was facilitated through a joint effort between the Korean Intellectual Property Office mm-hmm. and the Korea Intellectual Property Protection Agency. Uh, back in May, just a few months ago, a Chinese court ordered compensation payouts mm-hmm. between 200,000 and 300,000 yuan, uh, which is approximately 37 million and 55 million won, which is not a lot. Just, that just sounds like a slap on the wrist. Exactly. To these uh, Korean food companies. I mean, they did recognize, the Chinese court did recognize visual similarities in some of these products. Uh, but anyways, currently, each of these companies is going through a second trial mm. after a Chinese company appealed the court ruling. Appealed? Yeah, they appealed. Okay. Yeah. This is why it's such a loss for, you know, the companies because these trials can take years. And it's expensive. Sometimes we forget. Absolutely. And it's strenuous. And what company wants to focus that much yeah. attention and money and time? You know, into these this? companies spend so much money right. and time on R and D, and this this is just stealing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, there was a saying that used to say imitation is a form of flattery. It's one thing, mm-hmm. but I mean, to unabashedly take the entire idea right. and take credit for mm-hmm. it, uh, it's a whole different one. Mm-hmm. The world is watching. I'm just gonna say. Yep. <laughs> on to our second buzzword of the day. Over in Sao Paulo, Brazil, they've designated October twenty third. Korean Food Day. Yeah, you know what? We've talked about how uh, New York Mm -hmm. and Washington, D.C. in the United States designating uh, November 22nd Mm -hmm. uh, as Kimchi Day, Mm -hmm. right? And, uh, you know, several other cities have designated Hanbok Day as well to recognize the beautiful uh, Korean traditional, you know, garment. But anyways... uh, over in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, uh, you know, they have now designated October 23rd as Korean Food Day, recognizing mm-hmm. the, the the value of Korean food culture. So many questions. But first, <laughs> the logistics. What does it actually highlight? You know, the, the city council announced the designation uh, of the Korean Food Day Act on Wednesday yesterday. Mm. And the new law not only highlights Korean food culture, but it also promises to strengthen the the ties between the two cultures Mm. of South Korea and Brazil. And uh, the law was proposed and ushered through by the city councilwoman, Sandra Tadeau. Um, According to the Korean Consulate General in Sao Paulo, uh, the announcement uh, is an outcome that was made possible by, uh, you know, after diligent efforts Mm. of multiple entities, Uh, The Brazilian Korean community, the Korean Cultural Center played a part, as well as the Consulate General in Sao Paulo. Now, these three bodies have been promoting Korean cuisine endlessly in Brazil. They established a Korean uh, restaurant council. They hosted events like uh, food exhibitions and cooking contests. Okay. So... I don't know. Come October 23rd every year, there probably going to be lots of events, you know, uh, you know, inviting the locals to to try Korean food, try cooking, try eating together. And the joys of Korean food a lot of time is to bring people together. Right. right? I've been to many, many Mm -hmm. events where they bring out a large bowl and say, let's mix peepimpup together. Have you seen? And you think about it for a moment. I was like, is that sanitary? And then a second area is like, no, because we're mixing and then, you know, using separate bowls. Yeah. It's, it's such a Korean thing to do. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, Korean meals are meant to be communal. Mm. Yeah, we we mm. eat out of the same stew pot. Yes, yeah, yes, things yes. like that. Exactly. And obviously, there's been some valiant effort by locals to get this day designated <laughs> Korean Food Day. It didn't yeah. come out of left field, and there must have been support from the local community for a it lot. to actually become there a has, holiday. Yeah, exactly. There's been a growing appreciation and support for mm. Korean food culture, and I think that provided a significant push. 
for okay. this uh, latest designation. Now, mm-hmm. on a related note, the Sao Paulo City Council has also welcomed and passed a bill that proposed October 21st to be recognized as Hanbok Day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this Hanbok Day <laughs> is spreading all around the world. Now, the bill is currently waiting the mayor's signature to make it official. The thing is, New York has a lot of Koreans. That's right. So does Washington, D.C. Yeah. So does the state of California. Yeah. Yeah, so I got questioning, does Sao Paulo have I think significant so. yeah. Koreans? Okay. Yeah, there's a there's a very large Asian population in okay. Sao Paulo. There you go. Yeah. Some context. <laughs> it's not as random as it may seem. Right. <laughs> and on to our final buzzword of the day. So when it comes to these court cases, it's about precedence, mm-hmm. right? Uh, setting an example. The same goes with the IP intellectual property theft story. Um, the same goes with this story as well. Yeah. A father has been sentenced to six months in prison for neglecting to pay child care. Well, actually, the sentencing is about to take place. But but okay. uh, this is what the prosecutors have okay. asked the court. Mm. Um, so in Suwon, the prosecution is uh, pushing for a six-month prison sentence for ah. a man who okay. is currently facing trial for neglecting his duties, his uh, duties as a father to Which pay is against the law. That's right, to pay substantial uh, child support amounting to tens of millions of won. So this father was brought to trial. Uh, he was charged with violating the child support enforcement law. Mm. And uh, a 2017 divorce agreement, under this agreement, the man had the obligation to pay 300,000 won Mm. uh, per month Mm -hmm. per child. He has uh, several children to his ex-wife, but he failed to uphold his uh, financial and parental duties. uh, And he failed to pay child support even a year Mm. after an order by the court. Mm. So his ex-wife decided to sue the well, her ex-husband. To collect uh, the uh, mounting child support fees. Yeah, which amounts to 40 million won, mm. according to the mother. Okay. Uh, she had sought other legal remedies in the past. Uh, for example, uh, they managed to secure a cease, uh, you know, the man's mm. deposits uh, through two lawsuits. But the man still failed to pay child support. Again, that's why she decided to sue him back in April. Now, the man whose children um, are either adults or minors, um, the man expressed regret at the trial. He stated, you know, I feel bad for my children. I am sorry for not paying then pay up. I know. I, I I know. I must be missing some pieces. It's really simple. Then gather your monies, mm-hmm. sell your assets, right, and pay out what you owe. Exactly. You know, in Korea, I think this is also the case in uh, many different countries around the world as well. But um, even uh, even after you receive a court order to mm-hmm. pay childcare mm-hmm. uh, and you fail to, mm-hmm. um, you could. Uh, your your driver's license could be revoked. Okay, you could uh, be stopped at the border. Right, you, you can't leave the country. the country exactly, and your name could be made public as well. There's a whole uh, bad fathers mm-hmm. list. There is there are blogs, but there right. are also official sites in which they. Ha- after several warnings, mm. released the identity of these bad fathers, yep. essentially, who mm-hmm. failed to pay child care. That's right. OK. I, I, in this day and age, right? Mm. Um, pay up. It's really simple if you want to apologize to your children. Yep, that's right. OK. Unfortunately, that's only one example, mm. right? Uh, there's so a pretty many out there. Yep. Uh, again, it's about precedence. We'll have to wait and see how whether this, this man court. actually gets prison sentence for exactly. not paying up. All right. Thank you very much, Erica. <laughs> Pleasure. I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.